I'm not sure how you want to start, Kara. <laughs> um, you know, it's great to be here. For me, it's the coming together of the life I had at the Crest Foundation, which was very immersed in support for permanent collections in museums and um, often for the kind of research that can be hard to do because museums are often necessarily very focused on the upcoming exhibition schedule, so we invested a lot in the permanent collections um, and scholarship and ways to make um, sometimes works of art that weren't going to see the light of day in an exhibition really still have a life, whether it was for um, students and scholars, but making it more accessible. And in a lot of ways, what I do at World Monuments Fund is much the same. Um, there are wonderful heritage sites all over the world, many of them uh, over-visited, <laughs> like Angkor in Cambodia or um, certain um, you know, sites such as the Statue of Liberty um, in New York City. And then there are thousands of sites that are of equal importance that are less visited. So a lot of what we're doing at World Monuments Fund is trying to broaden our understanding of what heritage is and um, making people aware that they're often um, less well-known sites that are of great value. And so for me, it's been kind of a you know, continuous theme in my professional life that um, we need to learn to look more critically. Thanks, Lisa. I think um, that was definitely something that brings us together. When I first heard that I was paired with Lisa, I was a little nervous because I tend to do very localized heritage projects um, and tend to shy away from things that look more like universalism or sort of international heritage work. The work that I did, with, that I have done with seniors for four years in Toronto, where we would always go into the back of house, into the collections, was precisely around this um, idea that so much of what we have in museums is not out for the public. Um, and these seniors, in theory, could go to an exhibit at any time, but I knew how to get in the back and to get their hands on things. Um, and that was a really important um, project for us to work through and on and, and you know these seniors had no idea what was in the back and I think this is common a lot of our publics don't realize just how much we have and I, um, I love collections with all my heart but I also don't know that we can justify just keeping them in storage when we have so many pressing social issues in our communities if we're not using those collections why should our communities continue to support us um, and that work now has filtered through, um, I've joined Ruth Phillips um, into the ranks of GRASAC, which has long sought to figure out how do we um, bring awareness of collections that are often hidden away, they have not yet been digitized, they haven't been exhibited regularly. How do we bring those into the consciousness of people for whom they really matter? Um, and one of the things I find so exciting is actually what happens when you can host not an individual researcher, but collectives of people into those spaces. Um, and I think you've got a great opportunity with heritage sites, which necessarily have multiple people all together in them all the time experiencing them. And so I was really struck, and I hope you can share with the audience, um, more about how you, th how you approach heritage work where you're thinking both about the local audience and an international audience. Sure, well, um, you know, there's so many examples, it's hard to know which are the ones to pick, but um, I think if I give, um, you know, two examples, which actually um, Krista mentioned, which were the um, Churches of Lalibela and the um, Alabama Civil Rights Sites, I mean, in a lot of ways, they represent um, our thinking, even though they're vastly different places. So the churches of Lalibela um, are rock-hewn churches um, built in the Middle Ages as a Christian pilgrimage site. And it is today both a world heritage site, but still the um, most important um, Christian pilgrimage site in East Africa. And um, the problems of the churches of Lalibela are actually not complex. They're very, very typical in that water damage is eroding um, the stone. And because these were not quarried stone, but an, in essence are still live rock on an escarpment, 
the rock has continued to evolve. So the churches physically look like individual structures, but they are still connected to that escarpment. So um, you know, one of the first things we had to do when we started this project about a decade ago was bring in um, experts in geology and do a lot of geotechnical surveys to try and understand the problems and map how the water was getting into the buildings. Um, and one of the other issues was the EU had given the um, Ethiopian government money to build shelters over the churches because there was a misunderstanding of what the problem was. It wasn't rainwater coming from the sky, it was water coming from the ground being drawn up into the buildings. So the um, shelters both were a problem physically because the joy of that site is the way there's the site, the churches are so integrated into the landscape. And so you kind of imprisoned them when you put these shelters over them. It also potentially was exacerbating the problem by putting more weight on. And so while our goal was to address the problems, our approach really was to try and develop a local workforce and local capacity. So we worked with the Church Building and Grounds Committee. Uh, we brought in students and faculty from the university in Addis. And we, we really tried to minimize the number of foreign experts that had to come to the site. And a few years ago, we finished um, the restoration of Bet Gabriel Raphael, which is one of the most iconic churches, and we're now working on the church of Gogolta and um, Mikael. And, and it's the same approach. I mean, while there are two foreign stone masonry experts there on the site, the workforce um, is all Ethiopian. And because we're going to go away one day, um, and these churches matter to the local community as much to the foreign tourists who come. And this is an active site of worship. So, you know, our goal all the time is to try and, um, you know, do everything on the local level, source replacement materials locally, um, build capacity, and, um, and hopefully the next time there's a crisis, and hopefully there won't be a crisis, but the next time that there is one, there'll be local people who can come to the fore. And I think with the um, civil rights sites of Alabama, which came to us through our World Monuments Watch program, um, you know, everybody has heard of 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, but the people who nominated the civil rights sites of Alabama, their concern really is that most of the important sites in Alabama have little or no protection. Um, and when a certain generation of people who are now in their 70s and 80s pass away, with them will go an enormous set of stories and uh, a slice of history um, that can't be represented only by one church in Birmingham. And they also made the case very forcefully that the civil rights movement really was not um, a sort of 15 or 20 year episode, that it really started the day the Civil War ended. And they made an incredible case that it was really a century of civil rights activities. And um, so our, we're working with the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute and 20 institutions in Alabama to try and um, really capture all of those oral histories and those stories, which in many instances are multi-generational, um, because many of these places will go. They're farmhouses, um, they're um, people's private homes, but there's so much activity that happened in them over generations. And so that's a little bit of an unusual project for us, that it's not necessarily about um, restoring any physical place, but it, it's about capturing that history before we lose it. I love the underdog collection. <laughs> <laughs> I love those things that are not necessarily the most beautiful, that are probably not going to go on exhibit. Um, when we first started working with the seniors, we had a community collection that belonged to the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto, that's who cares for it. Um, and because it is a community cultural centre, we had more leeway to do things. I had been involved in really intensive handling projects at the British Museum and Pitt Rivers Museum. I knew statistically, based on evidence, that intensive handling was okay. 
Um, but with this community collection, because their drive is to serve the community, we were able to have lunch with it. So, yeah. <laughs> so we would bring the collection out every other Friday into the common room of the senior center, and the seniors would come down, and we would have lunch for them. And the, we would have parts of the collection in the center, and we would eat, and we would talk, um, and we would pass things around. And some of the pieces were quite fragile. And the seniors always responded to that. They, no one wants to break an artifact 99% of the time. There's, you know, there will, I love political action in museums too, so I appreciate when people do want to break something, but most of the time people really cared for these. And, um, but it was often things that um, don't get pride of place in an exhibition or a catalog that they were drawn to. And it was often because they were imagining the people associated with those pieces. And when um, we didn't want to force people to go into the museum because of the, the legacies of colonialism. But one of the things the seniors said to us after about three sessions together was, we should go to the museum, meaning the Royal Ontario Museum, which was four blocks away. I said, okay, we sort of listened to it. And then, then the next week they brought it up again. We should go to the museum. We thought, okay, right. We know how to get you into the museum, absolutely. So we called our colleagues and we went and we went in the back of house. And what they wanted to see was really old stuff. That's what they would say. We want to see really old stuff. <laughs> and we realized at that point, right, as people who've been in collections for a decade or more, we've had the privilege of seeing all of that really old stuff and they haven't. And so we went to the Royal Ontario Museum and they had such a good time and they said, we should go to the Smithsonian. <laughs> and I said, heck yes, we'll go to the Smithsonian. So we went for a week and it was full access behind the scenes and the things that captured our hearts and our minds were maple sugaring objects. So birch bark cones that were packed with maple sugar and you could still smell it. And there was, um, there were things in there that elders had heard about had, but had never seen, and you might not even really recognize that's what they were. Dolls that were made out of folded leaves that at this point were quite dry and crumbly. Um, and my favorite museum object I've seen now, um, there was a twig, and running across the twig were a set of duck bills, the upper bills of ducks, and you could still see a few little feathers, and they were packed with maple sugar. And apparently you would give them to kids as kind of a treat. And these just, no one had ever heard of these, no one had seen them. They were just amazing, and they just captured our imagination so much. And one of the reasons the curators there knew to bring them out for us, because we didn't ask to see them, was that an Anishinaabe curator and scholar, Alan Corbier, had been there a few months earlier doing research, and he was excited about them. And so his being able to be in those collections led to these amazing moments for us. But these. You know, these were not the beautiful bandolier bags that are, you know, so intricately and expertly beaded. These were really domestic, underdog kind of artifacts, but they opened up a whole range of stories for these women. And, and they saw so much beauty in them, the ingenuity um, and how beauty and ingenuity were linked. And so I can also imagine, um, the churches that are made out of the rock face, how the ingenuity of that is sort of part of their beauty as well. So it is, and I think, you know, with Lolly Bella, it's, you know, this extraordinary moment of thinking, you know, how did somebody get on top of that escarpment and say, you know, we're gonna build a pilgrimage site, it's gonna be the New Jerusalem, and we're gonna build down. And, um, and you know, the work, must have been arduous at a level that is incomprehensible. The other thing is they really understood the engineering because when you think about the age of these buildings, which is, you know, five, six hundred years old in most cases, um, they've really suffered very little from the environment. I mean, the water damage that we were addressing, while there's probably always been some measure of um, water damage, there was a great water management system in place, um, and you know it has eroded over time, and it needs to be reconstituted. But you think about the fact they really understood um, the materials they were using, 
and they understood the environment. And I think, you know, we see that over and over. We're also working at a site called Wat Chai Wat Hanaram in uh, Ayutthaya in Thailand. And the same, this was once, um, you know, a, an archipelago with um, t dozens of small islands. It's where three rivers converge. Water management has always been an issue there. The flooding in Southeast Asia is more intense now. Um, and the rains have gotten significantly heavier in the last several decades. And, um, but the other thing that has happened is it, uh, many of the canals that flushed water through the system very well have all been closed up. So, um, you know, what's changed is the environment. So where water used to have places to go, there are now parking lots and um, other you know, land that wasn't there. So the water issues that are happening are in part the increased rains and intensity of those rains, but also in part that in the 20th century we completely changed that environment and so the water has fewer places to go. Um, and so a lot of these places you realize the people who built them in the 13th, 14th, 15th century um, understood the environment in which they were building and um, it's really man's changes in the 19th and 20th centuries that are now causing some of the problems. And, um, and you know, understandably, tourism is a big part of GDP in most countries. And so um, there's a reason why people have invested in tourism amenities. Um, but, but sometimes you wish they had a little bit of that 14th century engineering ability. <laughs> so. so Lisa, one of the things we talked a lot about yesterday at the conference was about you know this question of decolonization, and I'm wondering if, as um, an institution based in New York, in New York, interested in global heritage and operating around the world, is decolonization a topic your organization has? Do you think about it in a different frame? You know, what what are what are the questions and concerns that your um, organization has? Well, I think our concern is always um, to be a good guest in whatever community we are. So, um, you know, no system is perfect. I'm sure we make mistakes, but um, we have at any given time about 50 projects. Right now, we probably have projects in 40 countries. Um, we have 25 staff members in New York and another dozen people who work for us around the world. But um, in any given year, we're hiring two or 300 um, consultants um, who are generally locally based. So we hope that the system we have in place means that um, we're acting, um, you know, as uh, a good colleague um, and we take our cues from our local um, advisors and our local partners. We generally are places where we've been invited to work, so we're, we're brought in often because of technical expertise um, and because of financial support we might be able to bring. Um, so, you know, if you're invited in, you're already, um, you know, hopefully in a good place. Um, I think when we're working in places um, like Cambodia and Thailand, um, we really are clear that we're there to bring some technical expertise and, um, and we are hopefully always as conscious of local practices as we can be. I mean, I would say in Cambodia where we've been working for 25 years, we've learned as much from the Cambodians as they've learned from us. Um, we've brought in a lot of technical expertise in terms of stone conservation and um, addressing physical conservation issues because that is a place where the entire cadre of people who were trained as art historians and archaeologists and conservators um, were indeed largely killed by the Khmer Rouge. So when we started working in 1989 in Cambodia, I mean, there was a desperate need to rebuild uh, the creative class in Cambodia. and. Um, and you know, many of the people who worked for us um, in those early years were the sole survivors of their family. And a woman who was in our training program in the 1990s 
um, was in the first class of people to graduate from architecture school after the Khmer Rouge, and she's now our senior architect running the program in Cambodia. And so we're enormously proud that um, Pali is part of our group. Um, but, you know, we're, we're highly aware that we stepped in at a moment when um, that, that country needed foreign assistance. And, um, you know, now we've got 120 Cambodians who run two conservation projects for us, and we come in a few times a year to check in and see how things are going, but, you know, it, it is definitely an all Cambodian-run project at this point, and we're providing some financial assistance and technical assistance. And, you know, I think that's an extreme example because that's gone on a long time. Most projects were there only a few years. So, you know, I think the colonial aspect of it is, is there. I mean, we're Westerners. I mean, I'm a white woman going to these places, but um, I, I think hopefully all WMF staff are highly cognizant of their role as um, a, a friend to the projects. We're not there to, I mean, these, these are other people's cultural heritage sites. We're fortunate to learn about them and be part of the teams, but I, I think most of the people who work at WMF, I, I would like to say all, I'm sure it's all, but I'm willing to admit maybe sometimes we um, goof, but, you know, I think we're all in that same mindset. It's such a privilege to be you know, like have the curtain pulled back and let us be invited in in these very special ways. But I'll go back to Lali Bella for a second. I mean, that it is such a holy place, and they have very strong feelings about um, non-Ethiopian um, Orthodox people being inside those buildings, that in order for our conservation project to happen, they actually hold a formal deconsecration ceremony, allow us to go in and work, then when the conservation work is done, they reconsecrate the building. So, you know, there's, you know, a clear example of we, we wait until they tell us they'll be willing to let foreigners go in. And we had another example of a um, um, pilgrimage site in Ladakh, India, where we worked. And that was a site, again, a very, very holy monastic site. They did not want um, foreigners to touch the walls and wall painting conservation was the goal of the project. And so we actually had somebody who trained the monks in how to do the work. Um, so we were very respectful that there was a problem to be solved. We could provide technical expertise, but we understood completely they didn't want anybody who wasn't Buddhist inside the building. Um, so again, there was a ceremony to allow us go in, do documentation, develop the conservation plan, and then the monks did the work. The idea of being a good guest, uh, I think, is something that in you know in our museum studies program, definitely my own teaching, I've been hoping to communicate with our students. And um, yesterday's conversations as well were you know encouraging us to think about the lands on which we do our work. Um, one of the things, is, so where I tend to do my work now is in Anishinaabe territory uh, with the University of Toronto. I've also recently learned that my house sits on um, Williams Treaty land from 1921, so part of my goal for the next few years will be to learn more about the Williams Treaty, um, and then, you know, not just where I work, but also where I, where I live, you know, how to be a better guest in, in, that, in that land. Um, and I think Canada is in this moment of figuring out. A, a lot of us are readjusting to the idea of being guests in this place as opposed to the people who are the hosts. Um, but it's a really important position to take, I think. And I think it's a really important position for museums, to, for museum staffs to take on as well. What is it to be a host and what is it to be a guest and how do you, how do you know when you're, which of those you are um, and how do you enact the behaviors that will be recognized as well by your host or your guest. Right? That's the other trick of it too. Um, the way that I would host something is not necessarily yeah. the same as someone else. Yeah. Well, um, we were talking this morning about the fact that we both teach, and um, and you know, you um, we both teach in programs that are two-year master's programs, and so you're trying to pack a lot of information, um, you know, into a two-year program, and hopefully. Um, put students out into the world in a way they become um, happy professionals and gainfully employed. And so I, I wonder with the emphasis on 
collections the way you've been describing? You know, is there um, something with students that you really hope they get the message of in that two year period or something that really astonishes the students about your approach? There's two things about it. Um, I'm a bit of a database nerd. I quite love them. Uh, partially because they represent this, um, they represent ways of knowing and knowledge production, and I think that's fascinating. Um, but I came across an entry, thanks to a student, again, of, um, of a bandolier bag um, and a tikanagan, so a cradle board. And the cradle board is cataloged in nomenclature 4.0, which is used widely. Um, if you go up the hierarchical list, it is classified as a human-powered vehicle, which is the same, yeah, <laughs> as a canoe or a bike, because you can transport a human in it, which you do. You transport a human in it. But <laughs> I just thought, oh, that's a really modern, gendered way of seeing the world. And there was not much about caring or nurturing or, or family or parenthood or childhood or anything. So, um, you know, I think also part of being a good host and a good guest is also trying to figure out how to, under, how do other people understand the world and how now that our collections are going online and it is uh, increasingly a public tool and not a tool that we use internally for our own museum processes that we need, but inc increasingly we treat it as a public tool to share our knowledge and to communicate with the public. We need to think about them differently. It's time to think about them differently. And um, so how can we think about fields or um, just how we conceptualize these items in our care? Um, there's interesting things we could do. We talk about um, chronological time. One of the th things I've learned from Grassack is also to think about ceremonial time or seasonal time. Um, you know, when we're working in, for example, social history collections, seasonal time is a huge part of what we do. If you think about all of the farming implements in historical museums, or if you think about um, seasonality in terms of um, dress, for example, we could catalog lots of collections in terms of seasonal time alongside chronological time. If we think about ceremonial time, we can then also be thinking about um, at what points and in whose calendar do these things become important. We just heard a fascinating idea, I think, um, from David George Shongo, who was the first archivist in the Seneca Nation. And he was talking with us about how they were renegotiating archival protocols. And he um, wanted to provide access to people who were interested, and he gave the example of a morning song, as in, it's the morning right now. And he said the appropriate thing would be to listen to it in the morning, which would be fine. You could do that if people were there in person. He, s he said, but then we started to think about, what if you were a researcher in Hawaii? And would a digital database be able to tell what time zone you were in and then help you modify your behavior in response? Yeah. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's just so fascinating. And so how can we use technologies potentially to um, help people see the world differently, right? Not just take for granted what we're doing, but to understand how we're producing knowledge. Um, and then I think the other thing in the classroom that I've done really most recently, um, in a course on uh, TRCs, museums and archives, the goal was to help students learn how to listen. We don't train graduate students to listen. We train them to critique and to respond and to analyze and to question. But precedents coming out of the Woodland Cultural Center um, through the art exhibition, Opening the Doors to Dialogue, that master beadworker Sam, uh, Sam Thomas organized and curated. Um, a video documentary they have about the Mohawk Residential School, which was, I think, the longest running in, um, residential school in Canada, um, and a very violent one. Um, a woman at the end of it says, I don't need you to question, and I don't need you to critique, I just need you to listen. And that's not at all what we've trained our students mm -hmm. to do. So instead, we designed a course around learning to listen. And what is it to listen, especially to really difficult stories and difficult histories, without responding? It's very hard. 
And so we also um, learned to quilt in that class so that we would have, this was Sam Thomas's genius idea. He had people come in um, to the Woodland Cultural Center. People were up on stage sharing their stories of reconciliation. And the people who were present learned how to bead and contributed beadwork to this art installation. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not indigenous. Quilting is a, is a cultural form, an artistic form that spreads across the world. There's a, this amazing history of human rights quilting. We can all quilt together and learn that, um, learn that art um, and keep our hands busy and hopefully keep our mouths shut. Um, and students responded immensely positively to it. It was, um, though they did say, oh, wow, I learned I'm a bad listener. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they also became conscious of that as well. Well, it's interesting you mentioned about, you know, inventories and, um, and um, you know, catalogs and the way we approach things. I mean, I often found, um, you know, both when I was at the Crest Foundation and certainly when I'm at World Monuments Fund, that often people feel very proprietary about certain kinds of information. And there's a certain kind of resistance to putting information online. And, um, you know, when I was at the Crest Foundation, there were beginnings of things like Art Store and, and, um, and other online resources. And, you know, the kind of great resistance to somehow feeling that you were giving a lot away, even though, you know, if these are public collections, um, you know, there is a certain mandate that sharing information and therefore sharing images can be a part of it. And certainly at World Monuments Fund, we're working at monuments that are, you know, out there in the landscape. They are publicly accessible. And, um, and I've always been a big believer that you know, the more you can put information out there in the long run, it's better because what we're trying to get people to do is embrace the reasons why we care for these places. And, um, you know, we have thousands of images up on our website, and my feeling is most of these places, anyone can go and take a photo. So you're, you're really not providing something that's a secret. We worked on a um, national inventory project in uh, Jordan, um, a number of years ago, um, a, it's an online resource called Mega Jordan, and um, Middle Eastern Geodatabase for Antiquities is what Mega stands for. And um, you know, there was a, a huge amount of debate about whether we were just, you know, handing looters a lot of information by putting um, these online maps with the archaeological site boundaries on them. And you know, most of us said, well, the looters sadly know where all of this is. Um, you don't really need um, Mega Jordan to tell them that. But the interesting thing is, what it really did was protect the sites in ways people hadn't understood before. Because, you know, if you look at something like the Atlas of the Ancient Greek and Roman World, published in the 19th century, you still have a lot of maps that show archaeological sites as dots. Um, and even well into the 20th century, you still produced a lot of maps where you know an archaeological site is a dot, but an archaeological site is not a dot, and it's it, it's a you know polygon of some sort, and so with a big breakthrough in Mega was showing the sites with their site boundaries and really showing um, what they looked like because if you continue to show archaeological sites as dots, what you end up with is roads driven right through them. Um, or in the case of Babylon and Iraq, uh, a pipeline that goes right through the middle of the site. Because somebody in the Ministry of Oil or in the planning department is looking at a dot and saying, well, we can put a road there. But in fact, if you see it as a polygon, you realize, oh my goodness, you know, if we put the pipeline there, we're actually you know, within meters of the processional way. We really need to be on the other side of the end of that polygon. And so, you know, I think one of the things that technology does let us do with inventories and catalogs is, I mean, as you are saying about the morning song, it, it forces us to think differently about how we conceptualize the concept of place. One of the trepidations I have around um, online cataloging um, is, a, is particularly around questions of representation and indigenous collections. And I feel like in terms of exhibitions, we have 
really made the shift where we're really mindful about voice and authority and who speaks for whom. But um, I am nervous when we put online catalogs up and then open up all of the commenting and public tagging features that we're only going to reproduce this problem of non-Indigenous people speaking for Indigenous collections. Just statistically speaking, in a country like Canada, the majority of internet users will not be Indigenous, just demographically. And so what happens then when we invite people um, or open up the space and say, you can comment on anything you want, right? Whether you know something about it or not. Um, be, and on the one hand, I understand how important civic conversation is. And on the other hand, I am curious about how we're going to contend with that question of representation with catalogs and inventories. Um, one of the things I, I also love about GRASAC's database is that you always have to say how you know something, even if it's a date, um, whether it's materials. And how you know something can be because an elder shared a story with you, you've examined the object uh, you know, visually, um, with your hands, um, you've seen it in an exhibition, it's from a catalog, but there's still always a prompt to say, how do you know? And I think that's a really important um, component too. You know, I think we need to embrace, or not, not shy away from the incompleteness of our records. We all know our records are incomplete, and yet sometimes we're afraid to change, or your registrars might feel afraid to change because they, you know, the catalog is supposed to be global. And if you make a change in one area, you should then go through and look at all the records and make sure that all the records are in sync. In truth, we know that's never how our records work. It's always the fact that a researcher comes in and adds knowledge to a set of objects, right, a set of artworks, and we can improve records at that moment. So I think we also need to be, um, we need to be mindful to, it. more and more our funding is coming through project-specific work, right? It's very hard to get funding for entire institutional processes. So I also, you know, want us to think about how do we take these project-based funding opportunities and think about a way to actually make a difference in our institutions as a whole, um, to create something that will actually better the, the permanent institution. Well, it's true, I, I guess we should um, open it up for um, Q&A, and I, I guess, you know, the, the final comment I'll make is that, you know, I think, you know, the other thing that we're always trying to do is, you know, we're very place-oriented, but um, a lot of the places we work, objects from those places are in museums, and I think one big change that we've done in more recent years is to try and make those connections. I think for years and years, we did our projects and we were not necessarily mindful of the connections that might exist to universities and um, museums that relate to our sites. And I think one, and we've got a lot of work still to do, but I, I think one area we've tried to become more cognizant of is the fact that many of these places um, have a, you know, a sort of afterlife that objects that came from these sites that are now in museum collections, um, we can work together to create a richer story because sometimes it's fascinating how objects left sites. Um, sometimes it left for bad reasons, but you know, sometimes it left, these objects left because practices change at places, things become less important to be physically on the site. Um, and certainly, um, in places where we've worked in the Middle East where it's now a conflict zone, kind of understanding when objects left is also an important component. So, you know, it's a constant dialogue and constantly wishing to do a better and better job and involve more people in the process, so. I think definitely that message of, I, I want to say embrace the afterlife, that sounds very <laughs> spiritual. Um, but I think that's definitely something I hope my students take away is not to see a piece, a piece's life story stopping when it enters the museum to embrace what happens to it afterwards. Yeah, right. And uh, to give it a rich life. Yeah. 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 Well, they're kind of never-ending stories that can keep going on and on, and so making those connections also brings in another dimension. Um, you know, certainly our work at Angkor, 
Um, we're working at a site called Phnom Bacane, which was denuded of all of its sculpture um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and most of it is in the Phnom Penh Museum. Some of it is in the Musée Guimet in Paris, but also just kind of imagining those, those objects are never going back to the site and they couldn't be well cared for because they've been in museums for so long, their ability to be outdoors would, would not be possible anymore. But kind of trying to understand what the site looked like when it was all together, I mean, is a valuable exercise as well. And so, um, and you can recreate things digitally that provide opportunities online. So, I mean, we're kind of always thinking, you know, how do you turn some of these negatives into a positive? Um, so, I don't know, with that, I guess we should turn it over to the audience for questions. Oh, we've left everybody speechless. <laughs> Hello, my name's Rebecca. I work at the Tang at Skidmore College. Um, I'm really interested in what you're saying about databases, and I was wondering if you could speak to the need to categorize and departmentalize different types of collections. So there will be a paintings collection, a sculpture collection, and sometimes there's also a specific cl collection for African arts or native arts, um, world cultures, objects, and kind of just speak to the terminology that we use and best practices of how we're organizing our objects. I think it's a huge challenge in really large institutions. Um, because when they are cataloged, they get siloed in a way that, you know, when we were at the Pitt Rivers Museum, for example, our catalog numbers and our accession numbers were the same, and everything was in one database. So you could see things all the time. Um, but that moment of collection, and then it, it, those pieces were designated then to be part of a certain family, say, in that larger institution. Um, for some of those pieces, then they've stopped being able to visit the other members of their family for a really long time, simply because of a cataloging choice. Um, and then if, if your databases don't talk to each other, um, you, could, you could really forget those other pieces. You know, with, with ethnographic collections, it's often the case that um, sometimes things are in ethnographic collections, but sometimes they're in botanical gardens. Um, and so, or, or, you know, botany collections or, um, you know, herbology or something like that. And so I think it really takes a lot of conversations uh, amongst staff to find those things. And I think the first port of call is for staff to talk to each other more and to be communicative about what you have that might be of interest to your colleagues in your institution. And I think that's a huge challenge in a large institution. I think medium and small institutions can remedy that more quickly. Um, but interoperability is, um, is something we should be planning for in our databases now. We should be thinking about that when we get a new operating system um, or if we're designing a new one. We should, build, we should be building that from the ground up now. But I fully appreciate that retroactively doing that is a huge amount of work, and it's not a sexy thing that most people want to fund. Yeah. Hi, I'm. I'm Jennifer Olivares, Minneapolis Institute of Art. I don't mean to open up a can of worms, but um, maybe this is more appropriate for Lisa. But thinking about the life of objects, we have a number of objects in our collection um, that are memorials. So perhaps they're a period room, perhaps they're an object. And if you think about, um, uh, I've had some conversations with colleagues about um, like Confederate memorials, for example, and removal of those. So. Do you either, either of you, I'd be, I guess I'd be interested in hearing your perspective about um, if you took, say, you had a period room that was a memorial to a, a particular person, you removed that from view or you deaccessioned it, um, it become, you know, what, how then does that affect the, the meaning and the value of that object? And perhaps Lisa can speak to that with, you know, any projects that have, you've dealt with through the World Monuments Fund. Uh, well, 
Fortunately, I guess we haven't had to directly address this at World Monuments Fund, but we have indirectly in that we've been working at Babylon um, in Iraq since 2007. And um, because the US Army encamped at Babylon um, after the US-led invasion, uh, there were a number of issues around developing the site management plan for Babylon, and we were working with the Iraq State Board of Antiquities. And so you've got a site that was excavated um, by um, the German Oriental Society and Robert Coldway um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Then after World War I, there was a kind of period of aban abandonment, and then the University of, Tor of Torino in Italy excavated there. And then very famously in the 1980s, there were um, huge amounts of Saddam Hussein era reconstructions on the site, um, as well as a um, memorial to Saddam Hussein that was built on the site. Then you've got the US-led invasion, and then there we were in 2007, 8, 9, 10, working on the site management plan. And we were very strong advocates for interpreting it all as layers of history and um, leaving things in place. Um, the Iraqis very much wanted all of the um, evidence that the US Army had been there removed, which was understandable. And, um, and there were mixed feelings about some of the Saddam Hussein era reconstructions. Um, and, um, and this one memorial to Saddam in particular um, was ultimately defaced by Iraqis and um, it was um, ultimately removed. But, um, you know, we were sitting on the sidelines kind of trying to figure out how to um, incorporate this into an ongoing management plan for the site. And so that was really personally my first confrontation with the fact that you could have a historic site that had layers of history that were not universally embraced. I think more recently, as a citizen of New York City, where there were controversies brought up around the Columbus Circle Memorial to Christopher Columbus and to the Roosevelt statue at the um, American Museum of Natural History, I mean, it, it's, it's, these are complex questions. And, um, you know, removing the sculpture doesn't necessarily address the problem fully. In other instances, I think some of the Confederate era monuments um, that, you know, there, there's a difference between something that memorializes the fallen dead in a war versus something that was erected really as a symbol of hatred. And I think that trying to decipher all of this is we're confronting for the first time in the United States. But I think the interesting thing is some of these memorials that are being called for being taken down, or indeed some of them that were recently taken down, when you look at history, some of them have been controversial since the day they went up. Um, and I also think the reality is public memorials are meant to reflect public sentiment. And demographics change, our understanding of history changes. And I think just as we are willing to have public monuments be erected, we have to be willing to have the discussion that maybe a public monument no longer serves a public benefit. Um, and I mean, I will say this purely as a person, not as a representative of World Monuments Fund. When the controversy started over the Roosevelt um, monument outside of the American Museum of Natural History, um, and I should be afraid to admit this, but I, I, I sort of thought to myself, oh yeah, that equestrian statue on the Central Park side of the museum. And, um, and when people started to talk about the two figures that flanked Roosevelt, um, the Native American and the African American, I literally thought to myself, there are figures on the side of that? I mean, I had been so uninterested in that monument my entire life. <laughs> that I had never noticed that there were, you know, I mean, I knew that Roosevelt, you know, father of the institution, I knew it was an equestrian statue. And then I thought to myself, I'm a cultural heritage person and I never stopped to look at that monument. And then when people started describing it, I thought, 
well, that is a little icky. And um, is that really what we want out in front of the museum? And so, I mean, I think that the city had a commission that was convened by the mayor. They went through a process. They ultimately decided to remove one sculpture from public view. Um, so I think people, it, you know, are trying to take this seriously and thoughtfully. Um, I think the Confederate monuments that have come down, by and large, um, strong public support for removing them because they really were put up, um, you know, squarely in the Jim Crow era. They were not memorials to the Civil War. They were really there to send a message to the African American community at the time about, you know, who was in charge, and um, and they. They, they represent, you know, antithetical values to who we are today. So, I mean, I, I don't think monuments should necessarily be destroyed. I mean, I think that there can be, as there have been, opportunities to move them into less prominent places or into museums. Um, I think that um, there's also good precedent for this. When Franco died um, in Spain, I mean, hundreds of memorials to Franco came down across the country. Um, and the same at the end of the Soviet Union, um, you know, many prominent um, statues of um, Lenin and Stalin were moved, um, some of them moved collectively into a park that became a park about the communist era. So I think that we're confronting it for the first time in the U.S., but people have confronted it um, in other ways in, in, in um, similar time periods. So. I think we have to be willing to have the dialogue, if nothing else. One of the most interesting ideas I've heard in the last year, and I learned it here in Montreal from Wayne Modest at the Tropin Museum, uh, and I think even there the idea came from a student protest group, is the idea of absence tours. Mm. So someone was asking the question yesterday about what do we do if our, if our collections don't represent what we want, the stories we want to tell. Um, and the idea of an absence tour is that we talk about what's not there. Um, and to me, this just has so much possibility. In that case, what the students were hoping for was that the museum would talk about its colonial history because they didn't feel that was there. But there's all kinds of other possibilities we can see. How could we engage community groups to come in and, and talk about what's not there? Um, we, know as, you know, we know as people who make exhibitions, who write, that we've excluded things, but this is potentially an opportunity to talk about what's missing. So if a memorial comes down or if objects go off display, that doesn't mean we don't talk about it or that we can't talk about it. Um, and maybe it's actually a chance to confront all of the other things that are missing that maybe should be there. Been Hi, really, uh, I'm Beth Finch from the Colby Museum, and I've been struck by how this, um, sorry if you can't see me, um, this conversation has moved from the local to the global and back, and how the local and its representation has informed your work globally, um, or can. And I wondered uh, also around the subject of listening and assessment. Um, sometimes the way we assess um, sort of reinscribe some of the power structures that we're talking about today. And I wondered if there's ways you've learned to assess your work um, that you found productive. It's a great question. Um, the students in the course, one of the things they commented to me was that in making the quilt, they were not assessed on the quilt because we were only two students in the class had ever sewn anything before. So there were other things that they were assessed on. But um, one of the things the students commented on about making the quilt was that it was the first time as a student she participated in making something for which she did not receive individual credit and where her name wasn't attached to it. And one of the interesting things that happened too is that we were gifting the quilt to an elder at the University of Toronto who led the um, Truth and Reconciliation Steering Committee and also won the Order of Canada this year, Lee Maracle. We thought she was a really deserving recipient. Um, so the day came when we were going to gift the quilt to her and she didn't, she didn't come. She didn't show up. And, um, you know, it's awkward, but what can you do? And so we talked about, well, like clearly something else came up that was more pressing than this. And as it turned out, she was unwell that day and 
I heard from her later and I brought the quilt to her later. But one of the students very maturely said the week after, I think it was better that she didn't come because I think otherwise we would have gifted this quilt, we would have felt really good about ourselves and again it would have been about us. Mm -hmm. And instead in not having that moment of gratification um, that was about her, you know, she was able to process that in a different way. I thought that was really profound. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to work through now is whether or not community quilting can help us provide an aesthetics for collaboration. Now, I appreciate that maybe isn't about assessment, but what I'm coming to learn about community quilting is that you can have five expert quilters creating a quilt together, and the end result is gonna be that it's all a little bit off. Right? So even though they're all expert at what they do, it's not going to be seamless. And so one of the things I'm trying to figure out is how can we take that message into our collaborative practice and think about whether or not we're doing programs, exhibitions, something like this Great Lakes Research Alliance. How do we understand that even when we have all these experts together, it's not going to be seamless or perfect and that, that shouldn't, that's not necessarily a good outcome. We actually want to see the different hands in there. And how do we then adjudicate funding proposals, peer review articles, peer review exhibitions with that aesthetic, in a sense, in mind? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have an answer, but I mean, I think that, you know, all of these projects have multi layers of jurisdiction to them, if, if you will. So if you look at a site like Angkor, um, it's a World Heritage Site and UNESCO has had a very um, intense role in helping to build capacity in Cambodia for caring for the site. It's under the jurisdiction of Apsara National Authority, um, which is in turn under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Culture. The Ministry of Tourism also has an interest in Angkor. So you've got a lot of people um, who opine about um, decisions at Angkor. And then you've got hundreds of Cambodians that work at the site, some of them working for Apsara National Authority and some of them working for the international teams such as World Monuments Fund. And, you know, I think that there's a whole set of decisions that happen at an international and national level at the site. And then there's the reality that there's the Cambodians who are doing all the work. Um, and so, I mean, I think we try to find subtle ways. And again, this isn't assessment, but I think it's indicative of when the assessments happen, that same kind of multi-dimensional input has to happen. So at one of our sites, there's about a mile steep climb up a hill, and it's the only hill at the site. And so we started to talk 10 years ago about the opportunity to maybe create some rest areas along that steep climb, um, because you have very dramatic views of the rest of Angkor Archaeological Park. And so what we really said to our Cambodian team is if we created some of these little rest areas and we had lookout points, what would we want to say to people? And so we let the Cambodians really drive um, the text and the locations of those rest areas. And um, I mean, I think with assessment at heritage sites, there's a kind of formal assessment process that happens in a certain way, especially at a World Heritage Site. But I mean, a lot of what we try and do along the way is empower the Cambodians to see themselves not just as site workers, but as true stewards of the site and that they've got a way to shape um, the narrative at that site and the way people experience it. And therefore, at the end of the day, they're influencing the kind of assessment that happens and what those assessment outcomes are. So I think we try to build into the process a huge amount of um, you know, bottom-up commentary that ultimately meets the sort of top-down management approach that's in place. So it's a dance. I'm, you know, some days we dance the steps better than others, but I mean, I think part of what we're trying to do is instigate that constant dance and not let it all just be decisions pushed down from the top. Krista? Um, thanks. This is really a riveting conversation, and I have a question, I think, probably more for you, Kara. Um, you talked about these underdog collections, and um, something I think I'm working on a project on an underdog collection at the moment. Um, and these 
things that are in museums that don't fit the kind of visual standards we've set um, about, you know, in terms of connoisseurship or, you know, the very visually focused nature of the, the art museum. I'm curious to hear more about your thoughts about museum display and how we unpack these rich stories that are associated often with these underdog collections. Um, or, you know, what, what strategies you feel are successful because there are so many objects that have these associations are so embedded with these histories that are not immediately present visually. And do you have any thoughts on that? So, and, and here's where me really not being a curator will come to the fore. <laughs> I've done one exhibit in 20 years. Um, and it was in a library. Um, uh, so I'll offer this, and I don't mean it to come off as sort of like the easy or the cop -it answer. Like what's, how about we bring those things out with people with them. So I'm also notoriously not a label reader. So you could do all the oral histories in the world and put long texts or even um, earphones out there and I'm probably not gonna be the one to listen. I really love to get close and look at pieces. Um, and if they're under glass, that's okay with me as long as I can get quite close and the lighting is good. Um, but if they're out and I can get even closer, then I'm really happy. And if I can be there looking at that with somebody who can teach me how to look at it and appreciate it, then I'm even happier. And so I think this goes back to the question of, you know, if 90% of our collections are in storage, and sometimes things absolutely do need to rest, I fully understand that. But lots of it doesn't need to rest as much as it does. Are we comfortable kind of bringing it back out into the world and into closer contact with people? Um, you know, can we get people and collections closer together? Um, and I would hope yes. And I think there's great opportunity for curators to share their knowledge in that way and their expertise. There's probably opportunities for our communities to come in and make connections with their own life stories uh, and those pieces. I think sometimes, too, we need to be comfortable with the idea that um, the story that gets told is not going to be the history of that object in particular, but that it's going to spark a different kind of history and a different kind of story uh, and a different, um, a different narrative. So we're not learning about that object, we're gonna learn about someone else. Um, and I think that'll just enrich how we understand these collections and make use of them. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, AAMC.